Hey, welcome back. And in this video, I'm going to do something slightly different. And we're going to talk about Fizzbuzz. And we're going to talk a little bit about the history of it, how it became popular as a sort of programming coding exercise, who came up with the idea, how it got popularized, etc, etc. And the reason I'm going to look at this is I was actually creating another video which was all about using Fizzbuzz to look at the bytecode of JavaScript and you know, and how you can understand kind of while loops and for loops and that video is going to come soon. But as I started doing the video, I started to find the history of this really fascinating. I, I just thought I wanted to get this out. So if you don't know what Fizzbuzz is, well, it's basically a kid's game where kids just sort of sit around a circle and they shout out numbers in sequence. So it'd be like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And usually in the programming exercise world, the range is sort of one to 100. Now, in the world of Fizzbuzz, right, rather than just shouting out all the numbers, if a number is sort of divisible by three, so three, six, nine, etc., then the kid would shout out fizz rather than the number. And if uh, the number is divisible by five, you would shout out buzz. And then, of course, if a number is divisible bo both by three and five, then it would be fizz buzz. Now, we say it's a children's game, but it's also a drinking game as well. But let's kind of move on from that. So you can kind of imagine how all this uh, stands together. So it ends up being one, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, seven, eight, fizz, buzz, 11, fizz, 13, 14, fizz buzz. And that's basically how it works. I think I got that right. I'll check it back in the edit, but I'm pretty sure I got that right. So to understand how fizz buzz became popularized in the programming world, we need to go back to 2007 and we need to go back to London where a chap called Imran Ghori, who was trying to hire a bunch of computer science graduates, got frustrated by the whole process. So he ended up looking for or an exercise where he was able to sort of, and it, the simplest exercise he could possibly come up with, which could test for basic programming skills. And that's how he decided that FizzBuzz would be a great programming exercise. If we look at the original article, which is still available today, um, I'll just bring this up on my screen. Uh, if you kind of look at it, it gives a little bit of the history, as I said there, um, but, the thing that's probably a little bit scary from his side of things, and I'll just highlight that, is he reckoned that most computer science graduates couldn't do the FizzBuzz exercise, and therefore he would just sort of filter them out. Now, when I say most, the numbers that sort of came out later was something like 199 out of 200, which is a lot. But is that the case today? Is that Was that the case in 2007? That was certainly Imran's experience. Um, I would suggest that's probably not the case today, especially because it's such a super popular exercise, but maybe what that was the case back then. Now, I'm not a big fan of coding tests. I understand why they exist. I think it's more fun for kind of like coding katas, coding golf, really understanding your styles and being able to improve your code. And that's why I was doing another video on, on Fizzbuzz. But, um, but I'm not a big fan of coding tests in that sense, but, but I know a lot of people are, and, and that's sort of fine. Now, if we look at the history of that, um, Imran obviously created this, this blog posting. And then of course, like most things that go viral, somebody else sort of picked that up. So how did that get popularized? Well, actually we have to look at another blog, which was called uh, Coding Horror. And I'm sure a lot of people who are watching this video knows about Coding Horror, the blog. And if you don't know about it, Coding Horror is a blog created by Jeff Atwood. And Jeff Atwood is another name you will recognize because he is the co-founder along with Joel Spolsky of Stack Overflow and the entire Stack Exchange uh, set of websites. So Jeff had this super popular blog and actually we can bring up the original article that, that Jeff had uh, created. And, and it was this whole thing on why programmers can't program. And, and Jeff sort of writes, he, he 
he sort of picked up the article from another chap called Reginald Braithwaite, which again, the original article is 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 available and you can sort of read about Reginald's thoughts and, and then Jeff obviously picked up on that and, and brought that into his own blog. And he was sort of shocked by the fact that 199 out of 200 people uh, couldn't uh, write code at all. So... Um, and then he refers to Imran's uh, piece and talks about the the fact that senior programmers were s struggling to do this exercise, it took them 10 to 15 minutes, and uh, junior programmers couldn't do it at all. And you know, and he was talking about why Imran thought that if you can solve tiny problems, then this is a good test, and tiny problems translates into larger problems, which is all fine. The bit that I'm probably wanting to get into next is Jeff didn't just look at it from those cases. He actually looked at other things and he looked at Dan uh, Cagle. I think that's how you pronounce it. His article uh, on how he had a similar experience with entry level programmers. Now, if you haven't read Dan's article, I think this is brilliant, by the way. You, you know, again, it's available online and it's this article on how computer scientists uh, can get hired. And that article that Dan Cagle wrote is probably so insightful even today and I recommend anyone checks it out. So the things he talks about back in 2007 are still super relevant today. So, um, so if you look at here, he's talking about a surprisingly large fraction of applicants, you know, even with master's PhDs fail during these interviews with coding tests and, you know, great. Um, and then he talks about what you can do. He talks about what, what interviewers are looking for, but he also talks about what you can do to get kind of better. And, and probably the thing I love the most is this thing that Dan says, which is you need to get public reputation. And fast forward on to 2021, public reputation is still absolutely huge, right? Are you Googleable? Um, are you YouTubeable? <laughs> have you got blogs, etc.? Are you on Twitter, right? You know, this is it, right? We have this sort of open society where anyone can be Googled and we can be checked out, and you need to have that sort of reputation. And and the second thing he talks about is how you gain that reputation. And and actually, he quotes uh, Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers, which is an amazing book, and I love the bits. And he talks about the ten thousand hours rule and saying, you know, actually, if you practice things for ten thousand hours, you will become a master. And then Dan sort of says, well, actually, probably to get a job though, you don't need ten thousand hours, which uh, you know, I probably agree and he thinks the number is closer to 500 hours for getting a job which is which is kind of uh makes sense and and, and i kind of get that and then he gets this whole bit about how can you get experience without a job and and, and this is brilliant and it's so relevant to today which is actually a good way of doing this is getting involved in open source projects. So, you know, start contributing to open source projects, start building unit or regression tests, you know, and and, and, and obviously he's talking about the wine project, which, uh, you know, which Dan is hugely involved in. But as you can kind of see, um, it doesn't matter which open source project you're interested in, that advice even now in 2021 is super relevant today and is something that you should sort of uh, take forward and going. So let's get back to Jeff's article for a second, and, and I love this, right? So as you can see in Jeff's article, Jeff gets really disturbed. He says, I'm disturbed and appalled that so many so-called programmers would apply for a job without being able to write the simplest of programs. And that's a slap in the face to anyone who writes software for a living. So Jeff is really, you know, can't understand this. Now, this is this is where the story gets absolutely brilliant, right? Because what, what happens, and this is really the start of this coding cat world, etc. is if you go down into the comment sections, there's got a huge amount of comments and volume. Then what you start to see is people started solving fizz buzz in the comment section. And we can we can kind of go down there and you can see people are putting uh, how to solve fizz buzz in various languages and start to optimize things. And then actually, if you look at the start of this, then uh, a sort of a, a discourse topic and Reddit topics come off the back of it where all of these people start trying to solve uh, fizz buzz. And, and I think that is just absolutely fantastic. Fantastic, and and again, the story does not stop here, right? So after after that, Jeff kind of posts this this new article, which uh, which is the uh, uh, Fizzbuzz programmers, the stairway to heaven, and and again, that article is online, so I'll just bring that up for you just now. Uh, you can read about it today, and then. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff is kind of frustrated about this on the amount of people who are suddenly start c 
coding up FizzBuzz in the comments sections. And as I said, it comes up on Dig, Reddit, etc. And he, and he sort of recognizes the fact that most programmers seen this as a challenge. And, and, and actually, I love the quote here. He said, it's his comments on FizzBuzz were interpreted, uh, you know, in the same way as guitarists would interpret, you know, if you walked into a guitar center and started yelling, most guitarists can't play Stairway to Heaven. And of course, at that point, all the guitarists would get their guitars out and start playing Stairway to Heaven, you know, and in, 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 in our case, and you can see this sort of picture of a guitarist playing there. I love this article. Um, and then, and then this is my favorite part, which is Jeff then says, I'm invoking the Wayne's World rule. If you haven't seen Wayne's World, go check it out, which is no stairway to heaven. So Jeff is saying, hey, stop, 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 stop with coding up fizz buzzes everywhere. Um, his sort of point where the point of the original article is why we have to ask people to write uh, FizzBuzz. It wasn't for us to all go ahead and start writing FizzBuzz in his, in his blog. And, and actually, so again, it's really interesting is, is Jeff says, FizzBuzz isn't meant for us. It's for the people we can't reach, the programmers who don't read anything, you know, the people that you're forced to give FizzBuzz tests to. And and I understand where, where Jeff is coming from because it's such a simple programming exercise. But actually, um, as we start to see in things like coding golfs and coding katas, actually being able to just come back to basics and write a FizzBuzz uh, uh, piece of code actually helps you understand styles, it under, helps you understand how things like for loops and while loops and words and the different variations and how conditionals work. And in the video that I was originally intending to create, you'll see how I use FizzBuzz to compare JavaScript that you write for different styles to what actually the bytecode underneath generates, um, which again, I think is super useful. So all of this thing, if we just sort of bring this back to where we were is that's kind of the history of FizzBuzz. I think it's super interesting. And without that today, without those articles, um, I don't think it would have been popularized the way the way it is, right? And now it's sort of a big part of our kind of computer science history, uh, whether it's in tests, whether it's in uh, coding katas, whether it's, and, and again, there's probably a whole other video we could do on that, um, whether it's on uh, things like Code Wars and et cetera. So, in a huge part of the world, but uh, you know, uh, Imran, Jeff, and, and especially Dan, I, I love the Dan Cagle article more than anything. Um, I think it's even in 2021, it's super relevant today. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it gives you a bit of taste of history and, uh, and, and maybe check out the actual video that I was intending to create at some point, which is on uh, JavaScript bytecode and, and FizzBuzz. Anyway, thanks and we'll speak soon.